Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the College of Fine Arts and Communications Faith and Work series. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, and um, we're going to start with an opening prayer by uh, Professor Mark Graham, who is a professor in the art department. And then uh, Gary Mark, who is the <coughs> chair in the, in the art department, will introduce Tara. And then, <coughs> excuse me, immediately following, we'll hear from Tara. If there is time at the end, we'll have questions. And if it turns out that there's not time, uh, we'll, there's a class that uh, begins here right after this. And so we'll step out. If you have questions for her, we'll step out into the hall in front of the Nell for questions if it seems like we're not going to have enough time. So we'll go ahead and get started with Mark. I'll wait. And the closing prayer will be given by uh, uh, Nicholas Estrada, who is a graduate student in the MPA program here. And Nick, you'll just speak out at the end. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful we have the opportunity to gather here today. And we're grateful for all the blessings that now is given in our lives and for the love and the knowledge we have received here. Father, we pray that we bless Tara as she, that she will be able to remember the things she has prepared and that she will feel thy spirit as she gives her talk today. And these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's my privilege to introduce Tara Carpenter. Tara's an assistant professor of art education, a ceramic and mixed media artist, and a single mother to an amazing 11-year-old daughter, Emily. This is her fifth year at BYU. During her time here, she has had many opportunities to travel with students and bring her daughter along. She co-directed two field studies with uh, Dr. Mark Graham, who just gave a prayer to Nepal and India, and has been on three smaller trips to study pottery making and ancient cultural sites in the American West. Among other things, Tara administers and supervises the art education practicum programs and the many Art Ed 326 Art for Elementary Educator courses. These are significant responsibilities, and Tara performs them wonderfully. She also created and directs the BYU Jumpstart program. This includes a series of community art classes and workshops that bring elementary and secondary students to campus to learn from BYU art education students. And it has been a big success. In addition to all, that Tara, uh, all of Tara's responsibilities as a professional faculty member, Tara continues to be an active scholar and artist, publishing, presenting, and exhibiting her artwork. Tara believes that teaching is a creative endeavor that feeds her artistic work. She's a valued teacher and member of the Department of Art. Let's welcome Tara. Um, 
There's a lot of women I could have interviewed. I just ended up with four, and I'll introduce them to you on the few slides. So, um, first with Heidi Muller Thompson. And I'll just tell you right now um, about how old their children are and how many they have, but later on you'll see a lot more about them. So, um, Heidi is, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my notes. There we go. Um, she has three children, and they range from 15 to 24. Um, I was in grad school with Heidi a long time ago for ceramics. Um, Meg Conley is an amazing writer, um, and she has two daughters, aged five and seven. Um, Sunny Taylor, many of you know, um, because she used to be here as faculty. Um, she has three children, um, and they're aged seven months to six years. And then um, Jay Amber Eckbert, who goes by Amber, um, she um, has three children aged 12 to 21. Um, I'm really grateful for these women um, for sharing their experiences with me, with my daughter, Emily, um, and for <coughs> willing to open their lives. Um, because this is a deeply personal thing. And I'm really, really grateful for Emily and Rachel, um, who helped clip all of their interviews and put that together for us to watch today. So, um, like Gary said, I am a single mother, and this is my daughter. Um, before um, Emily was born, I received a bachelor's in elementary education, um, taking just as many ceramics classes as they would let me. Um, and um, with Emily, we've done a lot of different things to balance our lives. So for the first four years of her life, I was a stay-at-home mom with her. Um, after that, I went back to grad school and um, did a degree in ceramics um, for two years. And then I've been at BYU for the last five years. So we've tried lots of different ways of making a mom and working and creating work work in our lives. Um, so I have this really great quote about um, young children. I want to kind of start there with babies. So. Um, they can be really, really hard to raise. <laughs> so any of you who have children will kind of be able to um, empathize with this. Um, and those of you who are looking to have children, um, I think this is lovely. He says, babies may be sweet, babies may be beautiful, they may be adored, but they have all the characteristics that are identified as mad <laughs> when they're too brazenly bound in adults. Babies are incontinent, they don't speak our language, they require constant monitoring to prevent self-harm. They seem to live excessively wishful lives of those who assume that they are the only person in the world. <laughs> so, if you can imagine having a roommate like that and what that might be like, <laughs> someone who is constantly wetting themselves and like, like doesn't respect your personal boundaries or space and constantly needs you, it can be really, really hard, right? Um, so, when Emily was young, um, my art was kind of created around this space of, of her and of taking care of her needs. Um, and just really the constant task of keeping her alive, along with things like laundry and um, just every other um, menial task that multiplies, like dishes. Um, so um, when I made art, I created it for her and about her and sometimes in spite of her because I was trying to find ways around her so that I could actually make something. Um, when I talked with Meg Conley, let me pull this up for you, um, she talked about the difficulty of mothering in early years. And so, let me get this one up. And um, she described some of the challenges that she had. It forced me to refine my thoughts because I didn't have time to write for hours a day. And, um, and I realized that there are stories everywhere and that in raising my little girl and the, the baby that was still inside of me, um, the, that maybe that was a story worth telling and it, and it was my story worth telling. And I don't think I ever would have gotten to that point on my own. I don't think I would have ever given myself permission to write about what was inside of me until um, I had pushed them out of me. Does that make sense? And so motherhood has clarified me. Um, marriage did the same thing. I, uh, I got married at 21, which is young. Well, not in Utah, but, <laughs> but anywhere else that's very young. I live in Oakland now, and when I pick up my kids from school, people ask if I'm the nanny because I'm so much younger than everyone else. So um, I love the way she just talks about motherhood. 
remember because um, she talked about you know how tough it was to be home with those kids, but she also talked about how that that was a catalyst, how that difficulty of pushing babies out of her was something that brought her the courage and the strength to write about those things. So it was like this stuff inside of her came out when she had children also coming out of her. Um, I want to kind of tell you a little bit about my story, and, and it'll kind of weave through the rest of this presentation. Um, in Emily's early years, I built this drama studio in my garage, um, and I worked from home. Um, I had taken, like I said, every class that I possibly could, so I had the background knowledge to kind of build things and make things. I got a kiln and a wheel and started putting stuff together. Um, and before I go any further, I also just want to acknowledge that um, when I talk about choices to be at home full time or to be working full time, I, I readily acknowledge that that's not always a choice. Um, and that for each person that's different. Um, that's up for us to decide um, what works for us feasibly as far as financially and emotionally, and also what will be best for our family. So I just wanted to say that on the side. Um, but when I, when I was home, and when I was home most of the time, um, nap time became art time. And so like whenever Emily fell asleep, I would just take my baby mother and I would like, run down to the garage so that I could make things. Um, and um, when there were deadlines or shows or things coming up, I would bring Emily down with me. And so she would join me. Um, at first, it was like in this pack and play, and I just had toys in there, and she was like playing while I was working on my stuff. And then as she got older, I involved her in the process of making things. So she would um, <laughs> grab a sponge and clean up. We'd play a game called Cinderella. She really was into princesses at that time, so like she thought it was great. <laughs> and she could pretend to be Cinderella and like clean up all my sludge on the floor, which was great for me too. Um, so that's kind of how I got her, her on board with um, being part of that activity. Um, and it's kind of sad, but she still really like enjoys cleaning wheels more than she likes throwing on Potter's wheel. <laughs> but I'll, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> so um, when um, she was younger, I was making mostly functional things. And I'll show you some pictures um, of my work. And um, so that was kind of the training that I had. I learned how to make a pot. And, oh, so here's her throne with me. Um, and so I made these kind of highly carved, sort of functional wares. Um, and I sold them on Etsy and at local fairs and festivals and things like that. And I taught classes at community art centers um, and for my house, too, to stay teaching. Because teaching's always been a really important part of my, my artistic practice. I feel more um, engaged in what I'm making when I can help teach other people how to do it, too. Um, so here's some more work as well. Um, I always enjoy like kind of playing with form and making the more um, different shapes. Um, I want to show you a video from Heidi. So Heidi talked about um, how um, she balanced um, her need for art making with her family and um, how that balance and her perception of that balance changed over time. So you can go ahead and hit play on this. Though there was this understanding too that mom isn't happy unless she gets some artwork done, so um, they could tell that it was something really important. And if um, you know, if they would give you know, let me have that time, mm -hmm. um, and time was really limited. You know, it's it seems like gradually I'm you know having a little bit more time on my hands with older children, but it's still a challenge um, even now, but to get in the studio. But, you know, there would come a times where I was, wasn't able to get in the studio maybe for weeks or whatever. And, and then it was just like, get out of the way. <laughs> I'm going in and leave me alone. And, and they could see, I mean, it was never really anything that they resented. I don't think. I mean, you'd probably you'd have to <laughs> interview them, I guess, to get the the other side of the story. But I think that they respected that I had this other passion, mm -hmm. and um, it benefited them because mm -hmm. I was a happier person. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's so integral to being an artist. I mean, um, there's this sense of just kind of things being intertwined. And I think it took me a while to kind of figure that out. As a young mother, I was always like, okay, waiting for the baby to take a nap so I could run into the studio for a half an hour, an hour, or whatever, or um, being frustrated. Mm -hmm. But when I realized that it's all one, like I kind of had this, you know, 
it was a gradual epiphany, but, but I, I kind of slowly realized that no, it needs to be one being a mother, um, can, like you said, influence the art and vice versa. And, um, as long as I kind of just keep an open mind and let things flow, um, I mean, motherhood has given me some of the best themes in my art. So I was kind of floored when she said that because that's how I worked my life before I ran to the studio whenever there was a nap. And so hearing her say that this is all one and that we can combine it all together has kind of like just changed my perspective on this. Um, even in the last couple months since I interviewed her, I keep thinking about how can I bring my life all together in such a way that it makes sense together. Um, and to maintain that perspective. Um, I'm going to put this back on the tech podium. Um, so a, a theme in motherhood and, and that I kind of faced as, as Emily grew older and as I worked from home was this idea of dependence and lack of independence. So having a child makes you less independent than you were before. Um, and so when I was at home yesterday with this totally, or totally dependent little being, um, I thought about these ways that I was becoming to on her, how I started to need being needed in some ways. And I started making these forms that were built to go together that kind of supported one another and were in this constant state of embrace, which can be a really sweet and tender thing, but can also be really overwhelming sometimes to have someone always attached to you. Um, uh, when I talked with um, Sunny Taylor, she talked a little bit about this change and going from being an independent person to someone who is more dependent and you have people who were dependent on her. So I'll go ahead and show you that clip. Um, uh, I think early on, I had to definitely decide what was more important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, if I didn't have children, I think I would have a much different career than I do today. I think I'd have my work probably in more galleries, I'd have more exhibitions, I'd make a lot more work, I'd probably make a lot more money with it, um, all of that. But I decided long ago that that's not nearly as important as having a family and being a mother. So I did, so I was a professor for six years at BYU. And I think about, I want to say two years into that, I had my first child. Mm -hmm. So for a while I had time to just be a professor and paint and all. I felt, I didn't feel like I had a lot of free time, but I really did now looking back. Um, and then I had my first kid and had to kind of learn how to make that balance. And it was, it was a lot to juggle, mm -hmm. teaching, trying to make art, being a mother. Um, I wasn't able to make nearly as much work as I wanted to then. But I loved, um, I loved a lot of aspects of that part of my career. Mm -hmm. Learning about art, researching, teaching. It was really, really, really great. Um, Uh-oh. Did you drop it? Uh, so I decided... Once I had two kids, and mm -hmm. I was when I was still full time mm -hmm. at BYU, that balance got harder and harder to find. It yeah. was just really, really hard to figure out how to do it all, mm -hmm. and the artwork was the thing that got cut out more and more. Mm -hmm. And over time, I just decided that I I had to focus a little bit more at home, and so mm -hmm. I resigned from that position to be full time with my kids. That's where I am now, mm -hmm. and I paint part time. When I'm not, so in the newborn phase, I don't paint as much, but when I'm not in the newborn phase, I usually paint about 15, probably 15 uh. hours a week on average. So we have to make some really tough choices when people depend on us. Do we decide to stay home more? Do we decide to stay more at work? Um, those are all things that we have to kind of parse out as we have these beings that, that depend upon us. Um, another thing that we become more dependent on is when um, we have children, we also become more dependent on our marriages and on our relationships, which can be really, really hard, especially if they don't work out. Um, my marriage was really good at first, but um, it began to fall apart right about as Emily was becoming a toddler, two, three, four. Um, and I came to feel really unsafe in my own home. And um, I'm not going to talk about what happened, but I just do want to say really quick that, that if you get to that point, if you're in a relationship and you start to feel unsafe, or there's a lack of trust, I hope you'll get help faster than I did. Um, so I had to make some tough decisions, and I had to decide how I could help this person that I was dependent upon um, and who depended on me. And um, I ended up separating and divorcing, 
And Emily came to work with me and has been with me pretty much full time since then. Um, her father still lives in Salt Lake and they still get to see one another. Um, but that process, it was, it was excruciating. And um, I um, started making work about the feelings that I was having and um, about the things that I was experiencing. So I had this dream that my home was melting from the inside and about to fall off a cliff. So I was making these kind of grotesque forms. Um, I was making these cutesy little houses and then destroying them. It actually kind of felt good to like <laughs> kind of these and like burn them and crush them and different things. Um, I felt like a juggler that I was trying to balance all these different things and trying to hold them together. Um, and they were always in this state about ready to fall apart. Um, and so I started to make these things in cliche, or sorry, in clay, um, and um, Freudian slip. They, they were a little cliche, <laughs> but, but they helped me <laughs> to um, to uh, process these things that, that didn't belong to words, you know, that that I, I wasn't sure how to talk about. Um, and my identity. So I had these identities. I was a Mormon. I was a mother, and I was a wife. And all those things were really tied together. But when that one part of being a wife, when that went away, um, it was a struggle of faith and perseverance to explore what that meant um, and what it meant to be a faithful member of the church who was no longer married. Um, and so I tried to keep all that was beautiful and precious about being a mother without throwing out what was awful and destructive about being a wife. Um, and there are just a lot of really, really beautiful things about our beliefs about motherhood, um, that we have eternal families. I draw so much comfort from the idea that Emily is sealed to me and that I can be with her. Um, some of the other women that I interviewed talked about how their faith influenced the way that they made art and the way that they chose to balance their lives. Um, I'm going to show you a clip from Amber who talked about um, how her faith in the church and her family helped her to balance and prioritize things. My faith um, has it keeps me grounded on what's the most important thing. And, and I think the rewards that I receive from my family um, far more outweigh the rewards that I receive as an artist. Although I, am, I do feel blessed and grateful to have that component in my life. So we believe that family is important. I'll just kind of leave this up for next time. Um, and that it's worth the sacrifices. Um, in our careers and in our missions and, and in the way that we choose to leave our life or lead our lives and that's a deeply personal choice and there's really no set of right sacrifices um, so let me get this back on the back um, so I went back to grad school um, and I got an MFA at the University of Utah and, um, and I became a provider for our family um, and uh, there were a lot of things that changed and a lot of hard things about that transition. Um, one of the hardest things that still, honestly, I struggle to say sometimes is figuring out who to take care of Emily when I'm not around. Um, and I know that's a challenge for not just people who are working full time or in school, but, but all of these women that I talked to talked about ways that they, um, you know, engaged friends and family or um, hired babysitters so they could make time and space in their lives. Um, Emily has been in preschool and um, all day kindergarten and after school and summer school and all these other things. Um, and uh, finding the right babysitter is a yearly quest. And um, on my best days, I know that she's turning out just fine and that um, me not being there all the time is actually probably a good thing for her <laughs> to have other role models in her life. Um, and to see me getting an education and being responsible in a job and all those things is probably really good for her. Um, but on her days, I feel really inadequate. Um, and the women that I talked with um, also felt a little bit of that too, some of the guilt um, in making those hard choices. Um, there's a really lovely quote um, from Nerissa Nels, and she um, talks about feeling good enough as a mother. Um, so she said, what's good enough? We don't get to know, we don't get to judge, but we do get to pledge every morning to do the best we can. Love the biggest love we've got, pay as much attention as we can muster, given our inevitable lack of sleep and level of overwhelm. A good barometer is this, how much did I enjoy my children today? How much did my own heart fill up with love and gratitude? If I go to bed smiling at something my child did or said, securing the knowledge that she's fed and clothed and warmed and loved, I call it a good day. 
In fact, I might even call myself a good mother. Art making um, helps me process the difficult emotions that come in finding these balances. Um, so during my first year at um, grad school, I shared a studio space with Heidi, um, who you've already seen, and she really kind of exemplified this soul-searching work. And so I want to show a clip from her talking about the work that she makes and why. The work is, you know, I guess some people would think of it as a little bit disturbing, <laughs> but <laughs> it, well, it just, um, it's meant to um, evoke emotion and to kind of um, have this relationship with the viewer that um, has to do with um, empathy. And mm -hmm. so I feel like, you know, you need to kind of dig deep and, and, um, you know, excavate those kinds of emotions. It's not, it's not always pretty on the surface of, of mm -hmm. things, of life. Um, watching Heidi work in that way um, really helped me to be more vulnerable in my work. Um, so got, through grad school, I made art about trauma and growth um, and how those things, things were happening simultaneously in my life at that time. Um, I made this installation piece um, of planting rose um, uh, that um, had these tiles with kind of spiky growth coming out. Um, and I use the dual meaning of the word growth as something that is a positive thing, like plants coming out of the ground, but also could be something dangerous that's developing, um, like these things that could practically impale you if you stepped on them. Um, so I was making work like that. I was also making work um, that explored this idea of connection, um, work that reached out to one another, that struggled for connection, um, sometimes on cracked landscapes that look like alien sorts of places. Um, I was looking at images of neurons and thinking about how we create habits and patterns in our daily life and how those things manifest um, in our interpersonal relationships. Um, and um, I also discovered participatory work. So this is a kind of art form um, where you put something out in the world but it's not finished until other people interact with it. Um, and so for this one, I asked viewers to write down something that they had been thinking but were unable to say aloud. There were so many things that I was unable to say aloud right then. Um, and so they could write down on these papers um, things, the secrets that they had that they just weren't ready to put into the world and then stab it into a slab of clay. Um, and then over time, it cracked and fell down. Um, and so it was a way to kind of release these things. Um, and then afterwards, they were fired, so the little slips burned away. Um, in another piece, I asked friends and, mem and um, family members to describe what connection meant for them. And they gave me a list of words, by, or 10 words that meant connection, 10 words that meant disconnection. Um, and then those words ended up on these little forms that was an 80-foot installation um, of the different um, connection, disconnection words that then people could take strings and, and connect together themselves. So these became maps, visual maps, of the way that we connect with one another. And maybe words that didn't mean anything to one person might mean something to somebody else. Um, and things that didn't connect for one person might connect for somebody else. Um, through grad school, um, art making kept me sane, um, and Emily kept me balanced. Um, so uh, even though having a kid might be seen as a disadvantage when going to grad school, it was actually an advantage for me because I had to stop um, and go home. I had friends that would stay in the studio all night and show up sometime the next day like half dead. Um, but I had to like cut out when it was time to go pick up my daughter and go home and get her. Um, and so um, I found ways within the schedule that I had to give her what she needed. Um, and giving is, is such a huge part of mothering. Um, there's joy in that. There's joy in being able to give someone what they need and to have them dependent on you. Um, and there's joy in sacrifice, too, um, even though that can be kind of hard sometimes. Um, Amber put this balance really, really well. Um, so let me share what she said about, about this idea of um, giving others what you need, but also giving yourself what you need. I think when I'm able to create art, mm -hmm. um, it kind of feeds my energy and my creativity as a mother. Um, I just need that extra thing um, that is just mine uh, to help kind of 
feed my own energy. As I'm able to do that, kind of fills up my reserves, and I feel like I can be a better mother. That mm -hmm. there's kind of that little missing part of me that's been filled up. I don't think it's selfish either. I feel like it's necessary to have some part of you that isn't constantly giving to other people that's mm -hmm. maybe receiving a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone needs that. And um, and I feel like it's a gift to those around you if you allow yourself to have that time to kind of regenerate yourself mm -hmm. um, creatively. So we, we give ourselves to others to help them. And then we also give to ourselves to be able to give them what they need more of. Um, there's a really lovely quote um, also in The Good Mother Myth, which is a great book. Um, that um, talks about the importance of giving ourselves time. So in this one, um, because in making the attempt as a woman to be fully human, we let our children grow up seeing our motherhood not as one of total self-sacrifice, but of one where we take care of ourselves, and in so doing, take better care of others. Not everyone's going to need our making to be fully human. I mean, this idea of fully human, what does that mean, right? Um, <laughs> But I do believe that it's healthy for us to have something else in our lives. For me, I was grad school and making art, but for others it might be something totally different. Um, something that helps us to express ourselves and, and to become more of what we want to be. Um, Meg talked about this pull um, to write and how she sees herself in her children, um, and, that, and that manifests in her art. And so, um, so, so I write, and a lot of things. Um, I got married at 21, and. Uh, marriage and then motherhood shortly thereafter um, cre uh, created a lot of situations and emotions that didn't belong to sound and so I became a better writer after that so so that's what I do yeah awesome um, how many kids you've already talked about you have two okay so how yeah so I have two children Margaret is seven going on 35 as oldest mm -hmm. often are and then um, Viola is five and she's kind of my spirit animal. Margaret is who I wanted to grow up to be, and Viola is who I am. And so both those things are good things, I think. <laughs> and I saw this pattern over and over again of women just expressing how they found themselves in their children um, in these weird ways, like their spirit animals, or finding out who they really were. Um, so when I was finishing up at the University of Utah, I saw a job opening at BYU in art education. And I applied, and I was so very grateful to be here. I'm grateful they hired me, and I'm grateful to still be here, um, because I really love my job. It's another one of those things that fulfills me and makes me happy, because I get to spend my day thinking and talking about art with people, and I get to help <coughs> more art be in the world by encouraging others to teach about art, which is something that really um, is fulfilling to me. Um, since coming to BYU, I've continued to make art, um, participatory art. Um, I created this installation um, in a gallery at Finch Lane um, over in Salt Lake. Um, and the whole installation was kind of an exercise in teaching as well as art, um, and asked viewers to participate in um, deciding what their definitions of artwork. And so I had people um, creating sculptures and um, adding to installations and also um, titling work and deciding uh, how many things changed um, what art was for them. And um, <clears throat> I, I think the philosophy rather behind um, participatory art really felt to well with what I do um, as an artist and as a teacher. Um, so this philosophy is that the art becomes stronger and more interesting the more people interact with it. Um, that complex ideas need many voices that you can't just answer for it on your own, that you need other people to, to help, um, and that um, we can understand ourselves and our ideas better when we interact with other people. Um, I want to talk about, about an, the idea of support in our lives. Um, so I've come to believe that none of us can do this whole balancing act as a woman and an artist, or as a man <laughs> with children and an artist, um, without other voices and other hands. I think we need people. So I'm not married, but I do rely sometimes really, really heavily on the men in my life. Um, and I rely on other women too. And um, whenever I've tried to rely just on myself, um, that's when Emily's life and my life suffers for it. Um, 
and um, we need each other. Um, and so I asked the artists that I interviewed, I asked them what advice they could give to the men who are in the lives of women who make art. Um, so I'm going to show you some responses to that. Um, let me get this up. I have um, a response from Amber, and then I also have a response from Meg um, about creating this uh, discourse about this. To support your wife and to understand that she needs more um, than to just give and give and give all the time. She needs a little bit of time to refuel and regenerate herself. And um, if she's an artist, then that is most likely going to require a little bit of time um, to herself to be able to create. And then the next clip is from Meg, and she talks about how we can create a dialogue around this. Um, I think, I think that once I got comfortable with making demands again, um, on myself, on time, on my situation, um, I felt like now I'm fighting against something. I had my hackles up, you know that, that's the saying, right? And, um, and so I felt defensive and I spent a little bit of time demanding without also asking. So I expected to be asked, how can I, I expected him to ask me, are you feeling fulfilled? Or whatever version of that question it was at the time. And I did not spend a lot of time asking him that same question. And this is what I'm saying again about, uh, I like the system of marriage. I don't know that we always implement it well. And I wasn't. And so um, I think women need to ask that question more often too, because I have to say that and you're all probably so much better than me. But I have to say that once I decided I deserved to be who I was, I didn't take a lot of time to ask him who he was for a while. And my heavens, did he take that in stride? And he probably shouldn't have. Um, <clears throat> but I have noticed that I am more likely to get what I want out of my marriage when I'm giving it to my marriage. And so a question, a conversation that we have a lot is, um, hey, Riley, are you happy? How do you feel about our marriage? Am I, am I touching you enough? And not just like in the bedroom, but like, do I hold your hand? Like, do I touch your hair? Do I notice you when after, or while we're putting the kids to bed and I'm tired and I need you to read the stories? Am I saying thank you? So I think this also holds true of our children. Um, the more Emily's grown, the more she's able to vocalize what she needs and um, how she's feeling. And so checking in with each other is a way that we stay vulnerable and that we understand one another. Um, and so I ask her, I ask her, are you happy? Are you happy with this thing? Um, how does this go? How are these things? And I try to be reciprocal and tell her how I'm doing about stuff. Like today, I told her I was really stressed out about the stuff that I have to get. Um, and so um, being vulnerable helps us to stay close. Um, in the last couple of years, my work's really meditated on this act of building a home. Um, because that's something that I ponder a lot in my personal life as I mother Emily and as I date. Um, so I've been creating these nest forms. Um, and uh, hopefully they will show up at some point. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, and uh, so I, I create them out of glass. It, it looks like twigs, but they're actually um, clay and glass um, and some metal. And um, so I use these really fragile materials to build um, uh, kind of a nest. And um, I intertwine these words to think about um, how birds build nests and then also how we as humans build um, structures to call home. Um, and I found it really fascinating that birds like, will build with anything that they can find. And I feel like that's a really wonderful metaphor for us as, as mothers and as families, that we, we build our homes with what we've got, <laughs> with what we can find, with what we can use. Um, and Emily and I um, have worked hard to build our own sort of home and place. Um, and that's been a lot of different places. Um, we uh, um, have traveled together. Um, Gary talked a little bit about our um, travels to Nepal and India. And um, we build this connection and this closeness together as we spend time with one another. Um, we climbed in mountains and we visited schools. And um, also here's a little plug, our show is out in the main, so you should check it out. Um, it's the opening next week. Um, and we create art about the places that we go. Um, so let me 
I actually get back for a second. Um, so when I asked uh, the women that I interviewed, um, what advice they had for you? So I, I told them I'd be speaking in this context, and I said, what advice do you have for us? If we're looking forward and we already have a family or we're trying to think forward about building a family, what can we do to make that feel stronger? Um, and so these are some of the things that they shared. Um, the first is from Sunny, um, and that's her advice to women. And then the next is from Heidi about structuring your life. I'd say go for it. There has never been a time in the history of the world when it was more possible than today. There are so many ways to, to make it happen, to have a career in creative fields and, and even do it from home. I mean, I have so many former students who are doing kind of what I'm doing right now. They're juggling mo motherhood and they're painting or doing photography or whatever and actually doing really well. I mean, there are a lot of ways to actually have a pretty good income with it. Um, and so I would just say, don't, don't think it's not impossible and just keep it in your life. Even if it's like five minutes a day, if you're doing that versus like waiting for months to find that chunk of 10 hours that you need to work, mm -hmm. those five minutes will make a huge, huge difference. I mean, they'll, they'll really be significant, significant. And the next thing is from Heidi. However you can make it all kind of be just, it's all your life, whether it's, um, you know, your, your riding, you, you, like my husband and I, we, we love bike riding, mountain biking, all that type of, um, being, and being outdoors. And that's, Part of my art practice too in a way that's mm -hmm. my time to kind of clear my mind and that's where you know I can come up with some ideas same thing with being with my children it's not that I want to be mm -hmm. like with them but my mind is elsewhere <laughs> coming up with art ideas but but it's all kind of one and that time is just as important but also give um, value to your creativity so I agree with Sunny that there's never been another time so many ways now that we can um, make art and make it part of our lives. Um, and I also agree with Heidi that, that finding that balance is really hard and maybe expanding what we think of as our artist practice, that maybe bike riding is part of the way we come up with ideas and maybe mothering is part of the way that we come up with ideas for our art and, and become creative in that. Um, I do want to temper all this with just a short description or a short thought rather about the idea of having it all um, because it's something I've thought about a lot lately. Um, and especially in today's culture. So um, I want to pull up this great quote um, from uh, uh, Jennifer Senior. She gave a lovely TED talk. Um, and she also wrote a book called All Joy and No Fun about raising kids and their effect on parents. Um, and she said, um, this question, the question of having it all, gets framed rather tiresomely as one of how and whether women can have it all, when the fact of the matter is that most women, and men for that matter, are simply trying to keep body and soul together. Uh, the phrase having it all has little to do with what women want. If anything, it's a reflection of a widespread and misplaced cultural belief shared by men and women alike that we, as middle-class Americans, have been given infinite promise and it's our obligation to exploit every ounce of it. Um, this ties in really beautifully with our LDS doctrine on the nature of the soul. We, we do have infinite promise. We believe that. Um, but not necessarily here and now, <laughs> right now, today. Um, in our day-to-day, -day, it's all about the struggle to make the little choices that help us become the person that we want to become. Um, it doesn't need to be our struggle to have it all, whatever that means. Um, because maybe that's not the most important thing to us. Um, my latest work um, kind of um, centers on um, this idea of being multiple things at once. Um, so it's a beehive covered in ampersands, so there's a little stamp. Um, which is and, 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 over and over again on there. Um, and as women, uh, we're so much more than just women, right? Um, we are women, and we're mothers, and we're writers, and we're artists, and we're all these other things that we're asked to do. Um, so it becomes this kind of an endless line of and, 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 right? Um, we are industrious and strong, and we can band together, and we can be like a hive, and we can accomplish so much good in the world. Um, and there's a lot of expected of us today in this culture. And there's a lot that we expect of ourselves. Like, I had so many expectations.
expectations for myself as a mom. I was going to be the perfect mom. I was going to do everything just right. Um, and that becomes such a burden. Um, so we can burn ourselves out and we can kind of and ourselves to death if we take on too much. Um, I got this lovely quote from, from Claire Hamaker, who is a BA student here. We were talking about this idea and she emailed me this lovely thought. Um, she said, the main thing that has helped me, oh, and she's a mother of five children getting a BA, which I think is incredible as well. Um, she said, the main thing that's helped me as a mother and an artist, and really just as a person, is to remember that I have a purpose on earth and that's unique to me. Everyone is going to have an opinion on what that purpose is. Teachers, blogs, internet, friends, family. But really, only I can find what that purpose is um, and what that purpose will look like in my vocation as a mother and an artist. I am the one familiar with um, my skill set. People will find what works for them and then want to project their feelings and their own plans for what worked for them on you. But stick to your guns and have confidence in what you're doing. That is the only way I've found for me to balance my family, and it's brought me insane amounts of happiness when I'm in the, that place of balance and priority that is set unique to me. So, as I've talked with people and I've pondered through this lecture, lecture I've come to believe that for me, the question is not, can I have it all? The question is, what do I need? What do I need to be happy? Um, and what do I need to feel whole? Um, for me, that's a lot of things. It looks like snuggles, and it looks like hugs, um, and dance parties at home with my daughter, and, and really, really terrible jokes, um, and having people close to me that matter to me. Um, um, it also means doing um, my job here, because I can support my family, and I can also um, find that fulfillment and getting more art into the world and working with young people and with older people who want to work with young people. Um, and I found purpose in that. Um, and um, I also need time to create my own work. And so when I look at my life and I look at the things that I need, I can prioritize and I say, these are the things that I need in my life to make me the kind of person that Emily Father wants me to be and the person that I want to be. Um, and I believe that as we make space for the things that we need to make us feel whole, whatever that is for us, um, we'll have more to share with others because we'll be more grounded in ourselves. Um, Meg Conley shares really powerful encouragement, so I'll show this last clip from her. Um, and and force yourself upon the world. Like I didn't. I don't know that I deserve my husband. And I mean, there are amazing women here. Um, but who cares if they don't deserve us? They have to deal with us, right? And so, um, and so, um, be loud. I uh, I gave this presentation a couple a couple months ago on Adam and Eve, um, and it, uh, it got pretty good responses. But there was one anonymous email, and and she said, "I never want to hear from that Megan Conley again. She's one of those noisy ones." And so I made that my Instagram bio a noisy one. Um, cause that's great. I think we should be noisy ones. And, um, for some people that means activism, but, but in a creative context, I just think that means letting whatever is inside you spill out and people can deal with it or not. But, um, but, um, just, uh, I, I please, for the sake of my daughters, please force yourselves upon the world because maybe the world will be a better place for them by the time they're your age. So I want to echo that. Please, women and men too, force yourself upon the world in powerful and good and upright ways, doing those things that fit with you and with your personality. And I just want to close with this thought that I believe that it's not only feasible to be a faithful LDS um, mother and an artist, but that it's a rewarding life choice, that it's um, desirable, that we can and should do that if that's what our calling in life. Um, I believe that artistic ambition and aspiration to raise a righteous family aren't contradictory, that they can help one another and be mutually supportive. Um, and the proclamation of the family, it teaches that mothers are primarily responsible for the nature of their children, but being a mother doesn't exclude a woman from leading, teaching, and inspiring through the arts. Uh, Elder Nelson said, we need women who know how to make important things happen by their faith. So mothering does restrict our available time, and it really does. <laughs> it restricts the time that we have. Um, it doesn't restrict the ability that we have to produce work that has rigor. Um, and we can, as Meg said, we can force ourselves upon the world. Um, and in the process, we can make ourselves better, we can make the world better, and we can make our children better for it. And I give you things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
here. Thank you for this opportunity to be met and gather as saints and students and artists and to learn from Tara. We pray at this time that our message may resonate with us and that we may take the things we have learned and carry them, that we may be loved. And we say these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.